Uh, my name is Jenny. I'm a rising senior from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm going to be talking about the formulas of politics today. So solve for y. Um, as someone not particularly mathematically minded, this just brings back a lot of residual anxiety from Algebra 1. Um, y equals mx plus b, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, so on. So we have these tedious formulas. They were tedious, they were annoying, but in a way they were also quite comforting because they told me exactly what to do. We had these two given points and the formula would very clearly graph the line between them. As humans, it's really natural that we seek out formulas. Um, we're creatures who love to be told what to do. We love routine, we love stability, simple paths, easy routes, direct passage. Complicated math problems aren't really preferable in real life because in real life we look at point A, point B, and then we search for a formula that um, we can plug the two into so that we know how to travel between them. So the journey, so to speak, is defined by its start and its end. Um, I'm really passionate about politics. In this recent election cycle, I ran social media and mass digital voter outreach for a mayoral campaign here in Cincinnati. And nowadays, voter contact is about touching as many people as possible. And that means something called name ID, uh, which is campaign jargon for the degree that people are able to recognize a candidate's name. So Joe Biden, for example, has amazing name ID. Pretty much everyone in America should know who he is. But on the other hand, a candidate like Marianne Williamson would have a lower name ID. The purpose of this is that the more people see a name, uh, the more they associate positive connotations with it, and the more likely they are to vote for that candidate. So this essentially is also how modern advertising works, except companies are selling a product instead of a platform or a person. So the why that we're solving for in a campaign is a vote. Point A is me. Point B is the voter. How does a campaign move between these points to communicate our message? Simple. We show you the candidate's name as many times as possible. In a way, it's quite manipulative, so there's a high level of thought that goes into this. Uh, what if on a flyer we attach a sticker in a handwritten font? Is someone more likely to pick it up? And then if they do, will they find the candidate more personable? Or what if we sell t-shirts with the candidate's face next to their name instead of on the other side of the shirt? Will that help a voter associate a face with the name, making the candidate seem more real? Everything innocuous down to the color of the text in an Instagram story is calculated to make you feel a certain way. Because really, we're not buying your vote, we're selling you a candidate. And that isn't to say that you should distrust all political campaigns, that is definitely not true. Uh, it's like if you see an ad for something, it doesn't automatically mean that that thing is low quality. It just means that the brand or the campaign is making you a promise. If you buy a Brandy Melville top, they promise you'll be fun, flirty, fashionable. If you buy a Pepsi, they promise you can fix racism like Kendall Jenner. If you vote for a candidate, they promise that you can have the rights and the resources that you wish for. Whether or not they keep these promises really depends on the person, the campaign, the brand. But at that point, you've already given up your ability to change your decision until the next election cycle, that is. Campaigns are always solving for why. It's important that we as voters also do the same. So why does this candidate appeal to me? Why do I enjoy their platform and why am I buying into their mythology? Let's look at Trump, for example. No matter our political views, we can agree that he cultivated a very dedicated voter base, as we can see in this photo. And how did he do it? He sold the idea of nostalgia, make America great again. He promised that if we voted for him, we could go back to the good old days. Did that happen? Not quite. But he promised that it would and people did buy into it. I'm sure if many of these people in this photo stop to think about why, the answer might not have been so clear. No one wants to label themselves as racist, misogynist, or elitist. No one likes to believe the worst of themselves. That's why fascism and demagogy are so prevalent in modern societies because people like to blindly follow a leader without asking why. It's easier that way, it's formulaic. Go to a rally, vote on election day, and everything will be the way that we want it to be. Sometimes the most morally deviant leaders have the most devoted cults because they understand this. Um, they understand that people want clear solutions to be told what to do, uh, people want the formula. Another modern example of this phenomenon is Marine Le Pen. She's the leader of the French far right and a past candidate for the French presidency. She ran on the slogan, au nom de peuple, in the name of the people. 
in this clip, she really frames herself as working for the people. She frames herself as working for progress and for any individual with maybe a little knowledge of her policies or her problematic history. She does seem like a perfectly viable candidate because she's saying all the right things. And then in Italy, Matteo Salvini is a similar case. Um, he's also a far right anti-immigrant politician. He is leading a charge to restore traditional European values. And so we can see a lot of problems in what he might be saying, but imagine as a disillusioned Italian citizen, you're struggling to make ends meet, you're full of this pent up frustration and anxiety, this type of conservative language would have its reassuring aspects. In fact, Salvini is a politician who really modeled himself off of Donald Trump. And so again, as bystanders, it's easy for us to see the flaws in this mode of thinking, but for those living in the situation, it is murkier. It's harder to question and thus to see clearly. Um, so these people like Marine Le Pen, Salvini, Trump even, these people are powerful, yes. Um, they may be demagogues, they may be fascist or anti-democratic, Yes, they're powerful. They offer these narratives to us. They can shape policy and they steer nations. But here, really, the power is in our hands. We being the voters, um, we're the ones who are buying into this ideology. We are the ones who put leaders into their offices and we're the ones who can remove them. So they may be point A, but we're point B. And without our votes, there is no destination. That is crucial to remember. The word democracy, is built up of demos, people, and kratos, power. The power belongs to the people. The difference between a democracy and an autocracy is what comes before kratos, uh, demos versus auto, the people versus the self. Um, in Latin, the letter Y that we're solving for was called e graeca, the Greek I. So Y wasn't a naturally phonetic sound for the Romans. They didn't have a real name for it. But why, asking why, is in our nature. And we often hear errare humanum est, but in reality, um, it's not that to err is human. The reality is that rogare humanum est, to question is human. And it is essential that we use this power um, to question in electing leaders, in making decisions, and most importantly, in understanding the narratives that we're being told.